Well, hi, Jason. It's so good to see you today. Great to see you as well. Yes, and thank you to everyone that is joining us from all around this gorgeous country of ours. Um, while we are all settling in and letting people into this morning's session, we're going to be talking all about mapping a donor journey. Um, feel free to drop in the chat. Where are you joining us from? And I hope you have so enjoyed the beginning of RNS. Uh, first off with our keynote speaker, but we're really going to start getting into the, the meat and the potatoes of this year's uh, sessions. But yeah, as we're waiting, let's go ahead and drop those in the chat. Um, but Jason, it's so great to have you today. Um, why don't you start off and tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're coming from? Yeah, uh, my name is Jason Lloyd. I am a director at American Philanthropic. We go by Anfil. Uh, I run uh, the kind of the Phoenix office of uh, Southwest Region uh, Core Consulting Services. We, uh, we provide uh, professional uh, services, uh, consulting services related to fundraising, and uh, development. That's excellent. Um, and I do believe that we um, we do have some slides that at the present moment I don't think are showing. Um, but while we're waiting for our slides to populate here, just give us one quick moment. Let's see here. Well, while we're waiting, I do want to introduce at least myself. My name is Kelly Cristaldi, and I am a Senior Product Marketing Manager here at Virtuous. And you may be thinking to yourself, what in the world is a product marketer? Um, I'm so glad you all asked. Um, what I help do at Virtuous here is talk to both our product and engineering teams and learn about all the really cool new things that we're building inside of our various platforms. And then I go to the market and I talk to our customers and here. What are your pain points? What are your woes? And how can we help you with our products solve those pain points? And that's really what we do here at Virtuous is to help resolve those issues so you can focus not on those mundane tasks that really backlog your team, but instead actually enable you to scale your mission through really responsive, intuitive tools. Um, but as we are, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties. It is truly a Tuesday that feels like a Monday, I believe. Uh, Really, today, we're going to be diving into a donor journey, and donor journeys are a really key part of any organization, um, especially those that are looking to kind of learn how we scale and grow our uh, personalized relationships with donors. I know that when I worked at a nonprofit, I was in the fundraising world for over five years for an animal welfare organization. We really did a lot of our donor journeys it was non-existent, actually, I should say. Um, it was maybe a one-touch email just yeah. saying thank you or a phone call or something like that. We really didn't have the bandwidth, the time, or the resources to do anything nearly as robust as what we're going to go through today. But uh, with a donor journey, it's the easiest way that you can truly automate and scale your relationships with your donors without having to do it all very manually. And I know that Amphil does a lot of that work as well. Yeah. Um, how like, how does Anvil really help fuel nonprofits uh, by leveraging donor journeys? Yeah, uh, donor journeys are, are crucial because uh, the you, you need to understand what um, the an organization needs to understand what a donor uh, interests are and how they want to be engaged with. Uh, and in doing that, you can better engage those donors and bring them into the life mission and vision of your organization. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, your, what you mentioned at the uh, nonprofit that you were at, uh, that's very uh, symptomatic uh, of all, most groups that we work with. It, it's busy and uh, leadership expects you to bring money in. And mm -hmm. so you focus on trying to do that. And uh, oftentimes it gets uh, very challenging to, to do that at, at scale. And so a donor journey, this, this is really how you can leverage uh, intentional and responsive communication at scale. Absolutely. So actually, let's start there. That's a really great question is for those of us that are joining in the chat, why don't you drop in there? Are you currently using any kind of donor journey? What does a donor journey look like for your organization? Is yeah. it something similar to my experience where it's just a, a one touch and honestly, you feel really good and you should feel really good about sending out that one touch email. That's great. Or is it you actually have a full like four, five, six email touch plan? You know, drop that in the chat. I'd love to see what's going on um, so we can, you know, see, engage how others are using donor journeys. Um, but to really put it at like brass tacks, right? So what does it mean to use a donor journey? And its most simplest definition and form, it is a series of emails 
and I should actually preface this, it doesn't always have to be emails, y'all. It's a series of <laughs> steps to connect. And yeah. what would you say are some of the top ways to uh, connect with supporters that aren't just through email? I think we kind of rely on email because we have come to a point to say like, yes, best practice is to send some kind of email out, but yeah. what are other touch points? Yeah, and before I jump into that, can I take a step back real Absolutely. quickly and just talk about the, the journey piece? I think one thing that we should talk about is uh, oftentimes we, we think that donors want to uh, engage with nonprofits and, and leave it there and, and just like their, their support is that and we don't want to bother them, whatever that is. Uh, but if you can guide them and come alongside them, give them a map, kind of help them understand, set those expectations of ways to interact with you, it's super helpful. And I, I think something that Virtuous does uh, extremely well, there's a packet that you'll be able to have access to here soon. Uh, that uh, goes through and tells a story of like hiking. If you uh, go to any national parks or a museum, I was just at a presidential library two weeks ago and there was an exhibit and I had two options. I could go through the exhibit and read the stuff on the wall, see the various things, or I could uh, have an audio tour. And I don't like audio tours. I think they look funny. I don't want to be that person. But at the same time, I did it. I'm thankful for that because it was a guided tour. It helped me understand the little things as I was going throughout the museum. And so when we talk about this donor journey, it uh, from a fundraising standpoint, as fundraisers, we need to help the donors understand the small things in each of the organizations. So how do you engage? Email is one of those things, mail is another, but it's much deeper than that. It's phone calls, it's meetings, it's text messages, it's videos, it's uh, websites, it's it's all of that. And so how do you integrate that together. I think that's what we'll, we'll start to unpack here. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the major questions that I typically always receive when either giving this conversation or just, you know, just speaking with others that are interested in having some kind of donor journey is that sounds great, but where do I start? start yeah. Yes. And um, there are a variety of ways that you can get started. But my number one uh, step, like the first step in all of this is before you do anything, before you sit down and you start mapping out this crazy elaborate thing, I um, want to urge and say, actually, maybe don't make it as complex. Um, oftentimes we think we need to do this grand thank you scheme when yeah. it comes to donor journeys. But really, look Let's start at a moderate level. Let's start with one to three touches. That could be something as simple as somebody submitting their donation for the first time on your online giving form. They get that immediate thank you email. And then maybe a day or two later, they get a call from your director of development. And then two weeks later, they get something like a postcard just summarizing that gift and saying thank you and showing the impact that it's having for that organization's mission. Um, now, how do we how do we get there, of course? Well, the first step in all of this is to uh, really look at and segment your donors. Yep. Now, we're going to want to create some kind of journey that is uh, personalized and segmented to a, to each type of giver. And we can start really quite basic here too. And we can get more complex in scale as we get further along. Um, but really we can start with, let's say, first time donors. Yep. We can do recurring donors and then major gifts as yep. well. Those are three yep. really great. And how would you actually suggest that we build some of those out? Yeah, I would look at the motivations for each of those buckets, mm -hmm. uh, segments, buckets, whatever you want to call them. I would, uh, I would look at what are those motivations behind it. And that's where it really gets into who your organization is. Uh, the, every organization is gonna be slightly different. Uh, maybe there's some, some trends that, that go with that, uh, but you can uh, understand and go, okay, a lapsed donor uh, is lapsed because they, they just forgot to give again. Um, what, what, what are those motivations for their, their original giving? And so uh, if they're lapsed, maybe they like the work that you do in this specific program. And so building a persona is uh, that next step to the segment. Uh, and the persona, it's, a, it's not supposed to be, uh, be a catch-all. It, it is supposed to be a catch-all. It's not supposed to be so specific that it, it identifies with everyone. It just needs to, uh, to be that catch-all. And so uh, what is that uh, persona, that, that name, or that, those, those generalities uh, for, for that? Absolutely. And let's take a step two and talk about personas. That may seem like a crazy marketing buzzword, and it's it's not actually, um, <laughs> although it, it really quite simply does sound like something like a marketing team would come up with. But a persona can be something like um, 
Her name is Sally. It's really per- personifying a type of donor. So say you're first time donors, we're going to have Sally in there. And as a first time donor, she hears about your cause through certain media channels and she engages in that way. It can be something um, like that. Uh, but it does look like, and again, y'all apologies really quickly about uh, the technical difficulties, uh, but hopefully you can see the slides now. Uh, but if we go to the next slide, of course, is mapping a donor journey and scaling it. Oh, dear. This might not work. Oh, dear. Oh, Y'all, it truly trying. is <laughs> a Tuesday that feels like a Monday. Okay, good. It wasn't just me. Oh, bless. We're, we're making progress. We you can, know what? You and I are doing great. It, yeah, we yes, can send we it can out send later. the slides later. You're gonna, you guys are going to get a lovely... Um, ebook after this anyways that you can download as well which is great uh but oh my goodness we're just not going to worry about that today it's just the kelly and jason show so we're we're on personas uh do we move past personas are we in the actions yes into actions into actions so after you identify the personas you need to list the the actions what how are you going to engage with uh, it's, it's not quite engagement yet. So that's in the messaging piece, but it's uh, the, the actions. Is this via your website? Is it via email? Is it via videos? Is it uh, what? What are some more of those creative, uh, those creative ways to to engage? So yes, um, yeah. And some of my favorite actions, by the way, too, when interacting with supporters, can be something that um, you may never thought of before, too. I know we keep talking about like emails, phone calls, handwritten notes, postcards, things like that. But how about um, you broaden that approach too? And it kind of goes back into segmentation as well. Um, Not everybody is going to be responsive to a postcard and everyone's going to be responsive to an email. Why not broaden that approach to something like SMS? Mm -hmm. Did you know that text messaging has one of the highest engagement levels of any media form? Imagine that. I believe the statistic is something like 90% of us have our phones. Mine is likely somewhere nearby, actually. Um, But everyone, 90% of the time, when someone gets a text message, they're going to open it in three minutes. Imagine your donor journey, if you're going to have, um, let's say, still, I believe that an email at the bare minimum should go out as soon as a donation is given, at least Mm -hmm. thanking and having that receipt portion to it. But why not make that second step, that next action be SMS? And from there, it can just be something like it's still expressing that generosity, still expressing that gratitude. And, and I think that's something that really needs to rely on a lot of the messaging when it comes to donor journeys is continuing to lean into that generosity feeling because that is how we as nonprofits can come together with our supporters. Yeah. I, I think one thing in the manual that uh, you'll, you'll get, it goes through the various actions. I'll let you run with that. Uh, the various actions. Uh, one thing that we talk a lot about at uh, Anfil is a culture of philanthropy. And how do you build that culture of philanthropy? There's four common uh, themes that uh, I'll unpack with that. The first is sharing stories. So how, what actions do you do that share stories? The stories of what we do is so important. Uh, that's uh, more than facts and figures. Uh, stories are what resonate, pull on those uh, heartstrings. The second is, is gratitude. And so how are you being thankful? How are you showing that gratitude to your donors, even to your colleagues? If you can't share, <laughs> show gratitude to one another, how can you show, the, show that to your donors? And so how do you build that into this process? The third is excellence. How do you show the excellence of what you do? How is what you do excellent, uh, striving for that excellence? And then the fourth is not being afraid to ask. The beauty of a donor journey is that it's not focused on the ask. The ask is going to become natural. And the ask is not just monetary. It's also volunteering. It's just ways of engagement. Uh, So those four things, stories, gratitude, excellence, and uh, asking. Excellent. And now that our slides are showing, I actually want to bring up because I just see a really interesting comment here on the screen is I hate receiving SMS messages from nonprofits. And that is a great point. And here's why. Not everyone likes to receive text messages. So, yes, Holly, like you're absolutely correct. And that's why we like to segment and create personas for each of our donors, because not everybody wants a text message. They do feel like it can be so impersonal that it just feels like mass produced when really we can still make it personalized. But there are others, plenty like you, that are also like, oh, I really just don't prefer getting that type of communication. And that's completely fine. We will make sure that that segment does not receive the SMS. Perhaps they're much better suited for something like an email or the phone call 
or a handwritten note. So that is absolutely um, just, that is a really wonderful point and it really leans into um, the donor journey. Um, next step, you know, we have create connections. So of course we wanna make sure that anytime that we are outreaching to our supporters that we're really trying to foster those relationships with our donors, we're trying to create connection. I know that when I was working for a nonprofit and I was in charge of our marketing and our fundraising, um, and I've told this story a number of times uh, to some of our customers is, I had this um, idea that if anybody subscribed to our email list, that surely meant that they wanted to hear anything and everything from us. And I just could not be uh, further from the truth. And why is that? It's because I had no connection with them. Mm -hmm. They had no connection with us aside from perhaps making a donation. So really, um, as we're creating these segments, these personas, we are creating like really generate, like, you know, generosity leading messaging. Make sure that you're also creating connections. What is another next step that you could do aside from like sending out a postcard or an email or a phone call? Perhaps inviting those donors, particularly your first time donors to your organization. If you have the luxury of having a brick and mortar type organization where you can invite donors to come and visit with you, I highly encourage this. That is a wonderful way for them to see in yeah. real time yeah. what that impact is like. Yeah, I, I refer to it as uh, bringing donors into the life mission and vision. I, yes. I stole that from a colleague of mine. Uh, ben, if you're watching, that's credit to you. Uh, and so, uh, but it's it's bringing life uh, donors into the life mission and vision. And a tour is one of the easiest ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't have a building, if your nonprofit uh, doesn't have a building that's worth touring, uh, even coffee, it's the it's those important connections. Uh, one little point on the uh, first time donors. I don't know if, if we said this. Please correct me. But uh, first time donor retention rate is somewhere around 20% on mm -hmm. average. Uh, industry best practice is around 30 to 35%. And so uh, the the way that you get that the, to increase is by listening, by interacting, having those connections. And exactly. So. And through those connections, go into our next point is where you can make suggestions. So let's say during that coffee date that you're having with a donor, it comes up in the conversation that, uh, you know, I really enjoy your mission and I want to get more personally in, involved with my time, that is an excellent opportunity to prompt a question about, well, why don't you become a mm -hmm. volunteer with us? Yeah. And something to take away from the donor journey lessons as well as I think sometimes as nonprofits, and, and I particularly fill in this bucket as well as a fundraiser, I always thought the next best suggestion was financial. And that is not always the yeah, case. Exactly. Um, we can offer so much more as a next best choice or suggestion for our supporters. It could be something like volunteering their time. Maybe it starts off slow with uh, once a quarter, but then it snowballs more until once a month, or they start to lead their own uh, group of volunteers, or they expand it to, say, their company and have a, a company-wide day of giving, things like that. Um, so it, it is important to remember that not every suggestion needs to be financial. It can be um, so much more than that. So don't funnel yourself into that little bucket that everything must bring in dollars. Um, that volunteer impact can have an enormous impact on your community as well. Yeah, no, that's very, very, uh, very good. The uh, and then the reviewing and learning is is crucial. If you don't take stock of uh, the feedback that you're getting from uh, the donors, and uh, one way that you can do that is through surveys and not super long surveys always. It can be short surveys, it's interactions over the coffee, over the tour, as listen to what the donors are, are telling you, what those, your supporters are telling you, your volunteers. Uh, and from that, you can uh, refine and uh, kind of restructure this process. Exactly. Uh, let's see, I was just reviewing some of the questions that have come and see if anything on there. Let's see here. Let's see. Oh, I need glasses today, y'all. <laughs> That's a tiny, tiny little type. Um, don't see anything too crazy right now, so that's great. But please, y'all, feel free to drop in those questions. Don't feel like you need to wait until the very last moment of this session. Um, we'd love to answer them as we go along. But um, to keep us moving, we've talked a lot about scaling a donor journey already. Mm -hmm. um, of course, leveraging automation tools really does enable your team. And I do just want to press in here again that 
when we say scale, that could still be something as simple as two to three steps. Mm -hmm. I really love to abide by the methodology of the crawl, walk, run. Uh, we so often, I think this is where we get scared and we're afraid to <laughs> pursue automation and hit the green go button. Um, I've heard from customers of ours before of like, I am terrified of hitting the go button. Like I'm going to blow up my system. Um, first and foremost, I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm still afraid to hit the go button. So I get it. Um, but really for scaling those donor journeys, start simple. Mm -hmm. Just start with crawling. What if it meant two steps? Okay, great. In a few weeks and you feel comfortable, your team is managing things. Then let's say we take it to five and then a year later, we're really running with full scale automation. And it's got a variety of steps in there, like seven to 10. So really scaling is based on your timing. Please do not feel that you need to just like often be a marathon runner of automation, not in the slightest. We really encourage you to take that really methodical, intentional approach to it. Mm -hmm. um, but here is a great example too of what scaling a donor journey could really look like. And I personally love event type, uh, examples, perhaps because I was really invested in event-based fundraising, so I get it. Um, but let's just imagine for a moment that we have a lovely young lady who has come to your event and she um, is invited mm -hmm. by a friend, a colleague, a spouse to come and participate in this event. And she just falls in love with the mission, um, really gets engaged, wants to learn more. And so she ends up participating, maybe she wins an item at the auction, at the silent auction, or she does make a donation. And a couple of days later, um, she gets a thank you email. Of course, like best practice. I will never deviate from this. It should always start with that thank you email uh, mm -hmm. because those thank you emails can offer up mm -hmm. a lot of value for yes. folks. Yeah. Um, what would you say are some of the best things to offer in that thank you email? In that thank you, uh, it, it really, uh, it, it can range. And so, uh, but thanking them for uh, connecting them back to the work that you're doing. And so the, the thank you for supporting this work as we do X, Y, Z. Uh, thanking them for, uh, if, if it's tied to the silent auction and the silent auction might be uh, for something in specific, being drawing that connection to uh, to that event, uh, and then that event back to to uh, your mission and vision. And so that's excellent. Always reinforcing the value because let's say, for example, Britt does go to your event, and she actually doesn't receive that email in a day. She may forget until she looks at her bank statement, and just goes, "Wait, food." food for food bank. When did I donate to the food bank? And it's yeah. like, oh, yeah. yes, I get that email. And it and it told me and it reinforced the values. Um, mm -hmm. Then let's say, for example, a couple of days later, they get that great call from your director of development. Now, listen, y'all, I understand making phone calls is burdensome. I remember working at my alumni center in college. And yes, I was that annoying girl. It shows um, that I was calling alumni to make donations. And a lot of times you just get voicemails and that's okay. You don't always have to speak to the donor. It is perfectly fine to leave a really great voicemail. It can be 10 to 15 seconds long, just saying, thank you so much. Of course, please use their first name or um, some kind of you know proper salutation to them. But even a simple voicemail can do wonders. Um, if they do pick up, great, because then you can actually have that conversation yeah. and perhaps even jump forward a couple steps and invite them on in and take yeah. a tour. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, one thing on the on the event side, this is why donor journeys are so important is because we get so distract, not distracted, just uh, pulled in different directions. And so with donor journeys, it helps you put time on task and systemize a lot of things that in a busy world after the event, uh, many people are often recuperating yes. <laughs> and taking that time to take a step back in and regroup and get ready for the next big thing. And so these donor journeys allow you to be able to be intentional and relational and connect. So. You know what? And this is a very timely question here is, would it be appropriate to have a volunteer make that thank you call? Actually, I'd say yes. Very much so. Very yes. much so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. To your point, if your staff is like recuperating from a major event, a major gala, having a volunteer, I mean, why not? They're most likely like just as heavily involved as your yeah. staff. Yeah. Absolutely have them make that thank you. Yeah. 
Exactly. I have not much more to add to that other than you're, the point of fundraising is just to connect donors to the life mission and vision. And if you can do that through volunteers, what better way to do that? If you can do that with your program staff, what better way to do that? Absolutely. Um, to continue on to this journey, of course, um, let's say that after that thank you call, they get an email once more. And this is actually where we can start surveying people. This is where we can start seeing where we can filter some buckets of where their interests may lie. Remember, um, not every uh, suggestion as we get to that point, the process needs to be financial. This is where we can start polling folks on how do you want to get involved with us? What is your interest? It could be simply volunteering. Yes, it could be financial. It also could be, hey, this was just something that I came to and I'm just not there yet. I'm, I'm not connected enough yet with the organization to maybe take a next step in that is perfectly fine. And I would argue to actually put a question like that into that survey or that type of answer because mm -hmm. that gives us a lot of knowledge on how to then engage with them further. Yes, exactly. The survey should have a point to it. Yes, uh, you should. should be able to uh, to glean that information and make changes to to these to these journeys. Absolutely. But you know, then of course Britt, she does visit the site, she fills out that survey, she responds in a positive manner. She visits your website. She starts digging around a little bit more and finding out new information. Um, and then she abandons. You know, she leaves perhaps a donation form. You know, she gets on there and she goes, this is great. I'm interested. Something pops up. You know, maybe a child comes into the room needing something. Maybe a work call comes through or a family member needs something as well. And she forgets. And guess what? You can actually have... Uh, what is called our responsive listener on that online donation form. And if she abandons it, it's going to trigger an email to go to her where it's going to prompt and remind her, hey, we saw you looking. You were like those like shopping emails. Okay, <laughs> I get those shopping I emails. I do not get those. Okay, well, uh, I get so. those emails <laughs> of, hey, you abandoned your car. It's very similar like that. Hey, you abandoned our donation page. Why don't you fulfill, you know, yeah. what you're going to do? Yeah. Um, and then from there, Britt does give, which is wonderful. Um, and then we're going to close that loop, of, you know, two weeks later with a great postcard. Um, what would you suggest as a best practice that postcard should have on it? Yeah, um, the uh, and this is a postcard for for the giving or the uh, just like a that, like nice like closing of the loop. Yes, she's donated at yeah. this point. Two weeks later, she gets yeah. a postcard. Yeah, um, I would lean into the gratitude piece mm -hmm. again, uh, and there's many ways to do it. Uh, I like to not just focus on thank you. Thank you is in gratitude, right? And so, uh, I mean, it, it is a form of gratitude, but it's uh, what what ways can you express that gratitude? And so, if she gave to a specific program, that postcard being a little bit more focused on the program, the top three impact that you're having in that area, um, leaning into kind of the, the areas that, that she supported, I would, I would recommend. Love that. And definitely love that hyper-personalization of it as well, not just like, thank you for donating to our food bank. And that is it. It's like, yes, we know this already. But, yeah. you know, how has that impacted? Maybe through her donation, they were able to feed like five more families. Yeah, and, and to scale to scalability of this, I think if if at the very least you can start with a thank you, start with a thank you. But if you are at a point where you can scale and go a little bit deeper, then customize it a little bit more. And uh, it's it's an ongoing journey. And so you can refine this. Yes. So. And that is why it's cyclical. Yeah. Um, I do want to pause because we are having some more wonderful comments come through. Um, let's see. Yes, Tiffany, I love to see this. Um, they just recently had a big thank-a-thon that was powered by volunteers, massively successful. I actually, um, to our point earlier about using volunteers, talk about someone that is dedicated and in love with your mission, calling and thanking donors. It is one thing for a staff member to do it, but to get a call from a, a volunteer that's heavily invested in your organization to call out and say, thank you so much. Like, I feel like that impact is more deeply felt yeah. than say if they, I mean, getting a call from a director of development is just as great, but there's something, I don't know, that tingly feeling you get from a volunteer yeah. that's like really deeply enriched in the org. Yeah. Um, Let's see, what about those donors who don't take action in the donor journey or stop midway? I'll, I'll take this one. Ooh, yes. And, and uh, I think it's easy to think everyone will participate in this, and that's just not going to be the case. So there are going to be donors that you won't hear from that, that won't respond in this way, and that's A-OK. -okay. If they stop mid-journey, then uh, reevaluate. Maybe there's uh, that's an opportunity to give them a phone call and uh, connect with them there. Maybe they won't respond to that. Either way, it's, uh, it's not a perfect system or a process. 
process in this, and that's okay. Um, and so kind of having the own journey for those who opt out of the journey uh, might be a good kind of workaround to that. I think that's great. And there's a follow-up question I think that marries quite beautifully with this is how would you suggest using the journey to reconnect with live buttons? Yes. Yeah. On, on that side, I, I think uh, if anyone figures out the uh, the silver bullet for this, please yes. share because uh, I think every organization struggles with this. And But this is the reason to do this is understanding why do donors to your organization lapse. Oftentimes, we did a study a few years ago, and I'm forgetting the, the breadth of it, but it was on Libunts itself, as something like 2,000 donors uh, interviewed across multiple organizations, over 60% did not know that they uh, lapsed in their wow. giving. Uh, they, they had either uh, thought that they were still giving or it, for whatever reason, they just did not know that they were lapsed. And so for that specific organization or set of organizations, that was the pinpoint and it was an information game. Uh, for other organizations, it might be different. Yeah, that's great. That's so good to know. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so we've kind of shown that initial uh, journey, right? The like the one, two, three, four. Here's what we can do for someone who's just come to an event, virtual, hybrid, in person. Here's how we can start to scale it, based on how your donors have become acquired by your organization. They've been invited by a friend through an event, through mail, peer-to-peer -peer media, like you know, social media. Say like a press release went out, or um, oftentimes it can be something through like a news channel, uh, getting featured on the news, the newspaper, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, and even through a personal connection, like a friend. And you can kind of see here how we can scale it based on that type of way they've come into the organization. And this is where we really see that segmentation come into, into play here, where we're not just taking every donor and bucketing them into just the, the one touch all, like mm -hmm. you came in and this is what you're getting. Instead, now it's highly personalized. It's very connected to the way that they want to be communicated with, especially if you ask something like that in a survey. Mm -hmm. I think that's another really great survey question to ask is how do you want to be communicated with? <laughs> um, but you can see here like how it moves through um, that kind of dynamic workflow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. And then, so here's something that you and I have talked about quite frequently is, you know, what challenges will I face in adopting this new engagement model? Like, yeah. this all sounds great. Yeah. I know that whenever I talk to customers, so I was like, I, I get it. It's wonderful. It's amazing. I know that I need to do yeah. it. Yeah. But what kind of challenges are people going to face? And I think we've touched on these briefly kind of throughout this conversation. The first, though, is uh, starting too big. Uh, I, I think... Uh, all of this is great. And so, uh, depending on your personality, you might want to jump in and go really, really big, do five personas, 10 personas, whatever that is. 10 might, is definitely too much depending on your organization. But uh, starting small, start being realistic. What can you achieve? And so is this actually helping you engage with uh, your donors in a better way. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, uh, the first challenge is just very much being realistic with what can you achieve in the next 12 months yes. and knowing that you can kick whatever you can't get done to the next 12 months. Yep. Uh, and then the second piece uh, is more uh, related, and I just had uh, absence, but it's, uh, it's more related to uh, the question that we were talking about earlier, which was... Um, oh, someone opting out of the journey. Like yes. some, so we, we think too often that everyone's going to be responsive. Everyone loves this work as much as we do. And unfortunately, that's just not the case. And so don't let the fear, though, of those few people dictate what this journey looks like. And so uh, there are people who are just as passionate as you are. And that, those are the ones that you're trying to find. So. That is so true. And I'd love to hear, too, in the comments, if anybody has launched their own version of a donor journey or automated workflow, mm -hmm. um, what challenges have you faced internally by launching such an endeavor? Well, we talk frequently here at Virtuous and with Amphil about change management mm -hmm. and how hard that can be internally. That applies to a new engagement model like this. So I'd love to see this as well. Uh, Let's see. And then a couple what, of great uh, questions. Yeah, one of the questions, what data do you need to create personas uh, that match your donor base? Uh, demographic data is mm -hmm. uh, one thing that's super helpful. Uh, there's tools out there that can help you do it. Um, also, uh, hopefully you'll have interactions with many of your donors. And so just that knowledge itself uh, is, is key. Uh, so demographics, uh, the personal relationships, giving history, uh, that's another piece. Mm -hmm. any, any others that you might think of? 
demographic is always great, giving peace. Um, I would even go so far as to say like what their interest in mm. your organization would be really helpful as well because arguably you could even create a journal journey for volunteers. Mm -hmm. You could go down that path as well. So I think that data could be really helpful. Um, even something where if you get really wild and crazy, you can start integrating something like wealth data and that yeah. could be a whole other ball game as well. Yeah, that's very good question. Excellent, so to kind of start concluding this session, because I'd love to still have time for questions, is right now we're kind of faced with two choices when it comes to donor journeys. We have the traditional, just join it, static, silo, kind of like we've been talking about this entire session. I get everyone's emails. Of course, they want to hear from me. Everything is going to be fine. Um, I maybe talk to one or two of those donors, and they go on to be really involved supporters of ours, and then that 76 partition or um, attrition rate kicks in and I lose everyone else. Mm -hmm. Or we can go into this more responsive model, which we've been showcasing this entire session, where it's that really deeply personal multi-channel engagement. Mm -hmm. That is the heart and soul of what a donor journey is. Um, creating those touch points that are really easy on your team mm -hmm. to not have to do manually. Yes, of course, there is manual process to setting up the workflow right. to put the building blocks in place. But once they're in place, that's it all until you start testing and listening and mm -hmm. seeing how we can edit and change those um, maybe different types of pieces. But, you know, do you want to be, and this is my question to the audience, you know, do you want to be staying in this traditional model where you may lose 76% because of the, of the attrition rate? Or do you want to move more into responsive where you can retain something closer to actually 80% of your donors instead of that 30. Yeah, and not not just re that retention, but find the donors that care passionate, yes. deeply about the work that you're doing. Uh, and from a major donor standpoint, that's uh, your major donors come from your, your, uh, your house file. And so uh, re retention is key. Retention is very key. And here's a really great fear that came in too, is uh, my fear with automation is that we will overlook a gift and I'm not confident that we have every single scenario thought out and set yeah. up properly. No, that's a great question, and may, that might be true. Um, <laughs> however, I think with the segmentation, there's certain level of attention given to certain levels of donors, uh, certain levels, certain demographics, certain whatever uh, best practices you put in uh, SOPs, standard operating procedures uh, in your organization that should help you uh, identify who, the, who those people are. Absolutely, and I do also wanna partner this up with a piece of uh, the technology inside Virtual CRM is the ability to tag. Mm -hmm. um, yes. You could easily have tags be a part of this as well, where when you're building up that donor journey workflow and if you are specifically working with first time donors and you can put a tag in there that says first time, they make a second donation, it re-tags them as such and actually moves them into a different workflow. So we're taking them out of that first time donor because it no longer applies to them. That messaging is no longer relevant, but we move them into that different pile. Um, we're now we're retooling our messaging to be more about that second donation. Mm -hmm. um, so there are ways to, to leverage the technology to help with that as well. Excellent. All right. So we actually have plenty of time left for questions, which is my favorite part of any session. So we'll see here um, what some other questions have come up. Let's see. Does it automatically remove the tag of the first time donor? And it does. So when your donor, your first time donor, if they're tagged as such, does make that second donation, they go back on your website, they go through your emails that you've been sending them, and it should always have a CTA, and perhaps it is to go back to your donation page, becoming something like a recurring donor. Um, once they make that second donation, the tag will be lifted off of that contact. They will be re-tagged with that second time donor or whatever that label is that you've created. And it will remove them from that first time donor workflow and will push them into a different pile. Mm -hmm. And I love the comment of creating the queries to, to track the workflow and kind of that double check. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, queries, so good. <laughs> yes. uh, let's see, what other questions? I don't know if we can scroll up a little bit on the chat and we can see a few things that have come in that we have perhaps missed this session. 
let's see here. Here's a great one. Um, here's a challenge. Knowing what is the right time to present a financial ask mm. and knowing when the prospect lead, not donor, is primed and ready to go. Yeah, uh, and, and that's highly situational. Um, so um, hopefully this will be helpful. But mapping out your donor journey, it needs to come at the right time. Once they are thanked properly, once that uh, you tell enough stories, and once that you've communicated the work that you are doing, then it should be a natural transition into that second uh, second ask. Ideally, that second ask comes sooner than later. Uh, you don't want to push that off for Ever, and you shouldn't be too afraid to to ask. Um, it, it's that that is the work that you are doing, and yeah. so it's giving that. I, I like to uh, paint it as a picture of giving the donor or the uh, person the opportunity to support the the work that you're doing even more. Uh, one mm -hmm. of those is a financial ask. It could be volunteering though, and other mm -hmm. other options. That's so true. And um, to those that are wondering specifically, like when to make that financial ask. We have a session on Thursday, so day three of RNS, where it's going to talk specifically about when is the right moment for a financial ask and the art and the science behind it as well. So check out the agenda for that one. I think it's a really nice session to, to marry up to this one as well. Uh, let's see. How do you retroactively segment a large donor base if we have a bunch of individuals that are not segmented and we can't track issue area. Let's see if we can click read more. That would be quite helpful. And I can get the rest of it um, for how they came in. How do we implement segmentation now? Yes. And I think this might be an example of starting simple versus making, if you have a large donor base, the temptation is to do a lot of segment, a lot of segments, a lot of personas, uh, but keeping it simple will help you refine that. And as you listen and engage with those donors, you'll better understand how to further segment. Um, and this is an example, someone might say, I don't want to be communicated via text message. That yes. then puts them in a very different segment. Uh, so that would be a simple answer to that. Excellent. Any recommendations for cultivating lapsed donors towards re-engagement? Any lapsed donors? Yeah, any specific recommendations for cultivating so lapsed donors towards re-engagement? So, yeah. so no, yep. that's great. I was oh, okay. reading another question. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, the um, so uh, if it is purely tied to the donor forgetting that they gave to your organization, that means getting uh, getting in front of them more and in different ways. Uh, as I mentioned the survey earlier, there's other groups that we work with where that isn't the case. Laps donors is because they uh, disagreed with the di direction, uh, kind of a change in the mission of the organization. And so in that case, the, the, there isn't really a chance to uh, re-engage if the, the mission alignment isn't that piece. Another piece is just a miscommunication of information. Uh, a donor feeling like uh, the, the program was moved in a different direction and so better clarifying what those programs are, are doing. So uh, really kind of going back to the fact, understanding why your donors are lapsed and then trying to target that, that reason. Excellent. Um, this is a great one from Haley is where can we find all the trainings what we're talking about this week? Uh, my favorite, it's the Academy. It's completely free. So for those of y'all that are joining us that are virtual customers or not, it's actually completely free. So if you are looking for additional ways and resources or really just want to see how this plays out uh, inside the platform, you can go to academy.virtuous.org and we'll have that drop in the chat. Um, and there you can actually see everything and how we can build all of this out inside of the platform. You do not have to be a paying customer. <laughs> you don't even have to pay for it. We just believe that everyone should have access to trainings like this. So hopefully that can be very helpful as well. Um, and thank you, Jen, for dropping that in the chat. But in just our few moments left, this has been really a okay. great conversation. Yep. Um, I do want to just put this up. So I know that Jen has shared the link a number of times, but hey, guess what? Did you know the QR codes came back? Um, <laughs> if anybody was around and remembers Blackberries, um, I remember that being like the hot reason to get a Blackberry, Blackberry. was QR yes. code ability. Um, and then COVID came back around and now look at us now, we're all oh, using QR codes it. again. Um, but here um, is a great resource that will really help you in this journey if you are interested in learning more as a resource and a guide for donor journey mapping. This entire guide will walk you through this step-by-step. Step. We've talked really high level today about 
donor journey and scalability and how that marries into responsiveness. But with this, it actually will break it down. It's something like an 80 to 90 page document. It's thorough. And my best recommendation is actually getting it and printing out some copies and sitting down with your teams and start mapping it out using the different workbooks, the different checklists that are inside of this um, this guide. And it'll really help y'all start seeing where you can start today with a donor journey and then where you could take it in the future. Excellent. All right, everybody. Well, we want to thank you so very much for joining us of today's session. We're learning all about donor journeys. I was joined, of course, by my wonderful colleague, Jason Lloyd. If you'd like to get in touch with him at any point, his information is here on the screen. Jason, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It was great. Yeah, absolutely. And then if you ever have any questions about Amphil, uh, anything donor journey that y'all do such a great please. job, plus many other wonderful capabilities, please feel free to reach out. Um, and then, of course, you can reach out to me as well with any uh, questions that you may have. My proverbial inbox is always open. I love to hear from folks. But if you are looking for some next great sessions, if you want to go back to the agenda, there are tons of wonderful sessions coming up the remainder of today. Um, and I do want to remind folks that if you are looking for CFRE credits, you can actually earn 35 but we've been, by being a part of RNS this week. So please um, download our checklist, see what uh, sessions qualify, and get those on your list. Take care of some of those CR, uh, CF credits for you this year. But thank you all so much for joining.